Good morning and good afternoon, everybody, or wherever you are all over the world. Uh, if anything, number one, congratulations for the uh, Liver Cancer Awareness Month. And of course, a big thank and congratulations for the American Liver Foundation for really continuing to take the lead in regard to this very important month. Well, wholeheartedly, we as a team, and when we say team, it's the physicians, the patients, the loved ones, all together, uh, we are together to really fight this dreadly disease. And I'm really greatly honored uh, to again join uh, my very dear colleagues. And really, we are a team. And you should see how much we interact among each other for whatever is best for patients. Uh, I know you heard a lot today. And if anything, I'm going to try, as I was tasked uh, to, to do, is to really try to bring in the therapy back into perspective uh, just to see where things go. And of course, it's totally understandable that uh, any of the patients with liver cancer, they're gonna come say, you know what, I have this problem, I want it behind me and I wanna move on. This is really how we all live in life. Like, you know, we have a problem, wanna fix it and move on. And if anything, uh, you realize that, uh, yes, we are hopefully capable of doing that, but sadly not necessarily all the time. But it does not mean if we cannot do a fuel cure, in other words, get rid of the disease, it's the end of the story. Absolutely not. How many of us, all of us, without any exception, have some little problems in our lives here and there, and we still live our life without necessarily having it impact us in any way. And this is what we probably are continuing to use is to kind of like new methodologies, new approaches to really make sure that people are living with cancer, not necessarily just throw cancer behind us and move on. Yes, we like that, but that doesn't mean that we cannot live with cancer. So it's not the fight about cancer or against cancer, it's about living with cancer. So with this kind of perspective, and I'm on purpose brought this up first because it's going to be very important how we delineate the different therapeutic interventions. And of course, I'll start from the top of the pyramid, understand what we all would like to, uh, to think of. Of course, that's very straightforward. Small, limited disease in the liver, very good liver function, take it out. Absolutely. Surgery is totally appropriate and uh, applicable. At the same time, if it's a small disease in the liver, very small, really even smaller than small, a couple of centimeter, no more, or in other words, less than an inch, and good liver function, we can even ablate it. Ablate it means we're just going to burn it with some technique that the intervention radiologist, and same time, like Dr. Bo yesterday you heard, or at the same time, surgeons sometimes will do. Now, as you already kind of you know heard, uh, Dr. Guy, she's expert, and Dr. Tadei as well, is that if the liver function is not that good, i.e., yes, the cancer is there, it's limited, but the liver is not doing that well, this is where transplant comes into play. And this is where we not only get rid of the cancer, but we're actually changing the liver to a liver which is now more functional and able to sustain our life. Now, those three curative intents, as we said, in regard to surgery, radio frequency ablation and also transplant add to some other you know less used nowadays different intervention like alcohol injection what have we but the three ones surgery radio frequency ablation and transplant we're very happy to see them happening for many patients but we have to remember it's not going to be applicable for all patients but it does not mean if we don't hear any of those three choices that's it the story is over absolutely not and I really mean that because after all, as a medical oncologist, I can tell you, I, 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 number one, I'm busy, like, like everybody else, which is good. It means that we are able to help patients because sadly, if there was nothing else to do, we'll not be busy. So it's very important to remember, yes, we have a lot of kind of, you know, assets and a lot of opportunities to help patients. So as we move from the pyramid, and on purpose, I called it the pyramid because as we can imagine, the top of the pyramid is a very narrow kind of part of the triangle where we can do those curative intent we just spoke about. But then we come next to what we call locally advanced disease. You're gonna hear that here and there, and it says that the cancer is still in the liver only, but it's probably more extensive than it should have been. And in other words, where all those three options that we just gave in, in regard to surgery, radio frequency ablation, or transplant are not applicable. This is where the art of local therapy come into play. And this is, to give credit, is a very well-established intervention that can be done and can take care of the liver. 
if anything, it's very straightforward. What the doctors will do, they usually are the interventional radiologist, highly expert, high expertise in regard to doing a catheterization. In other words, they build in a kind of a catheter, same like with a heart catheter. They put it in the groin and they travel with it all the way to the liver. And there, the liver has a big plus. The liver sustains actually two blood supplies. It's like, imagine, like you have like electricity power in your home from two sources. The power that comes to you as well as the generator, maybe. Same thing, the liver has double, double, double blood supply. Why is that? Because by nature, the liver is a very important industry in our body that clean up the blood as it comes from the lower part of the body as it goes to the heart. So that kind of blood passing by to be cleaned by the liver is still blood. And of course, it can sustain the liver. For whatever reason, it appears to me that liver cancer loves to live on clean blood, on the red blood. While the blue blood, in other words, the blood that's going back to the heart to be oxygenated again, is the one that we can still use some sustenance, for, sustenance from it and support, but it's not where the cancer is living. So when we embolize, in other words, we throw little pebbles of certain material to block the blood supply from the tumor, we are blocking the blood supply from the artery from the clean blood and we're still dependent on the blue blood to support the liver this can be done in endless number of ways we're not here to really compare them or talk about them but if anything you probably heard about chemo embolization where chemotherapy is added to the embolization you probably heard about the bland embolization where this if anything there will be embolization with no chemotherapy and you heard also probably about radioembolization, where there will be small radiation pebbles that will actually throw in to throw some radiation therapy. So with all of those, no doubt that patients will ultimately benefit. And if anything, they will uh, be getting that therapy, not necessarily only once, maybe it could be more than once, but they will have a great relationship with their doctors caring for that therapy. Now, sadly, at some point in time, this might not be enough. It could be still the disease is localized in the liver, or it could be that decided to go out of the liver. And please, please, again, a reminder, it does not mean this story is over. Absolutely not. The perception that all of us always had, whenever one of our colleagues in interventional radiology or in surgery say, oh, I'm going to send you to the cancer doctor, to the oncologist, the chemotherapy guy. Well, number one, we don't use chemotherapy for that disease. You're going to be blown away what we use for that disease. And number two is, we're not really there, like just kind of like sitting and, you know, just waiting for people, God forbid, to die from disease. Absolutely not. We are here to contain and continue maintaining the disease as long as we can. And actually, the, as long as we can, can be pretty long. And if anything, it's nice to see now with the advent of that many therapies that patients can go from first line to second line to third line, even fourth line. It's really a reflection about how well we're doing with patients enough that they have a normal life. I always jokingly say in clinic, if a patient comes to me and start complaining that I'm probably like five minutes late, I'll say this means it's good. The fact that they have other things to worry about, it means that they're doing very well clinically. So what do we do for, uh, for, for therapy for liver cancer? As we said, chemotherapy is used, but not really in many places. Maybe in some part of the world, there's some data on it. We kind of do attempt it here and there, but really the priority is more different type of therapy. The first one of which is targeted therapy, where we kind of like go after a specific target and we try to hurt the tumor so they can die. And you probably remember the drug that was first approved for that purpose called sorafenib. This was almost 12 years ago. Proudly, where I am at Sloan Kettering, we did the first study on that. This was followed on by the Barcelona group to really prove that it does improve on survival. Interestingly, for 20 years or so, it's not like we're doing nothing. We were busy trying to enhance and advance on the sorafenib. Sadly, we could not. But if anything, it will be important to recognize that all the efforts are very genuine, extremely give a lot of credit for all the efforts that everybody has done. We were part of it as well. Teamwork was really a very solid component. And nothing really happened for almost 10 years until the advent of more novel therapies. By that time, we recognized that could be other, again, targeted therapies of value among which you probably heard about called lymvatinib. And then if anything, 
we start thinking in a different dimension at this point in time. And actually, uh, while I'm still talking about what we give as first line treatment, we have sorafenib, we have lenvatinib, and we have a combination of immunotherapy plus one of those biologic agents, which is atezolizumab plus bevacizumab. And if anything, this really showed a tremendous improvement in outcome. And if anything, again, it could be available for uh, the patients who really are eligible for that. They need probably some further testing, but it's appropriate and it's appropriately okay to be done, but they definitely can benefit from that therapy as well. And actually look how timely it is. As actually today, today I mentioned a little bit ago, incredible, literally exactly, and I'm a little bit excited about that, uh, exactly 10 hours ago, literally 10 hours ago at 2 a.m., well, many of you in the Eastern uh, time zone or probably 1 a.m. in the Central, wherever you are, um, a announcement came out that another study, which is a combination of two immunotherapies together called dervalumab and tramilumumab is reported positive. This is how fast the information is happening. We proudly led that study from Sloan Kettering, and it was a large study, about 1,200 patients worldwide, and we're very delighted that just at 2 a.m., I kind of, you know, got the call, and the study is positive. It's incredible that this is how fast things are happening. So I think this is really but a message, not for despair, but to really be very positive about all what we can help with for getting patients in a better shape. Now, let's assume any of those therapies that already are approved, as we said, sorafenib, lenvatinib, atezolizumab plus bevacizumab, and though hopefully we'll see once the data start coming out from what is 10 hours old only, which is the dorvalumab plus trimumab, let's assume now we're going to move to a second line treatment. Didn't work, did not tolerate it, whatever it is, we come to second line treatment. Again, we have a lot of choices, among which actually the first one that come to mind is cabozantinib. Cabozantinib is a very intriguing drug that again we proudly led from Sloan Kettering worldwide. And if anything, not only it was applicable and approved in second line, but also in third line. Add to this, we have rigorafenib, which is again targeted therapy as well. And we have remisurumab. And on top of that, we have also immunotherapy. One of them made it to be approved. It's called pembrolizumab in second line. And there is also a conditional approval still there for a combination called epilumab plus nivolumab. As you can see, the therapy choices are beyond endless. There's many of them that are there. And if anything, it will be appropriate to always have discussion with your doctors about what's needed. Now, as I delineated what can happen in the very early stage of the disease, when the disease is limited to deliver and we can really get rid of it, surgery, radiofrequency ablation, transplant. We spoke about local advanced disease, we talk about the different form embolization, chemoembolization, bland embolization, radioembolization. We also spoke ultimately about systemic therapy. And we said in first line, we have sorafenib, lenvatinib, atezolizumab plus bevacizumab, And hopefully soon, as 10 hours ago, we already heard that the positive study called the Himalaya study with dervalumab plus trimumab. In second line, we have cabozantinib. We have also rigorafenib. We have remisurumab, and also we have pembrolizumab, as well as ipilumab plus nivolumab. And then third line, as we said, we have cabozantinib. So now the question is, uh, and I'm sure many of you are asking, well, what about radiation? Absolutely. That's a very important thing. In the old days, we were very concerned about maybe if we radiate too much the liver, it might hurt. Actually, the technology is so advanced. A lot of our colleagues really have elaborated a lot of efforts to really make sure that radiation will apply. I would say still it's with the norm of a clinical trial. And I go back to what uh, Dr. Guy and Dr. today just mentioned about the need for clinical trial. But nonetheless, yes, certain applicability for it might be visited and your doctors might talk about it. Now, another important concept that's really is to be brought up, which is rather very particular for liver cancer. It's a two-way street because I know very well, and remember, we are all physicians, we interact with all of you, and we know very well what kind of comes through our mind. Patient will come and say, well, uh, what stage is it? And with the idea that stage means that's it, this is what I get, or this is how we're long live. Absolutely not. Please, the staging is a good language for me to call Dr. Tede and discuss a patient. But remember, it's not necessarily an implication of really, that's the only implication of survival. Absolutely not. 
If anything, along that line, to remember that we think always that it's a one-way street from limited disease to more advanced disease to metastatic disease. But we always have learned that in liver cancer specific, it's a two-way street. We kind of always, and this is what I say to patients, everything remains on the table. We never say no to anything because you never know what you can get. With the advance and the further expansion of the use of those systemic therapies, we're seeing more and more of those positive outcomes, enough that can we, for example, invite a patient to get systemic therapy to now go with some local therapy because things are better and better controlled? Of course it can happen. So please always remember that it's a two-way street, but it's an important reminder. And thankfully, we're all very good at that in our specialties, different specialties, teamwork. As you heard from me in the beginning, I said we are a great team and we work all together. And absolutely we do. Because it has been shown, some nice work that was done by some of our colleagues have shown that a patient who are seen by more than one specialist, i.e. by surgery, transplant surgery, hepatology, gastroenterology, oncology, international radiology, um, radiation oncology, et cetera, will definitely fare better. And we should not ever forget about the need for supportive care because we know it's a big plate to kind of carry with having cancer. Psychosurgical support will be needed. Uh, the nurses and their support will be very critical and super important. And remember also your pharmacist will be very key in regard to that. Social work, and many other venue will be always available wherever you're being taken care of. Another important bring point, to bring point to bring in over here as well is how do we look at that disease? Understandably, we all kind of, you know, have the perception we need. We live all in a culture where, you know, yes, no, uh, up or down, higher or lower. And as such, we kind of end up really believing that if the CAT scan is showing or the MRI is showing that the tumor is smaller, that's great news. And this is all what I care about. Well, remember, the MRI and the CAT scan are only representation of the body of the patient themselves. And as such, I always tell my trainees and my young doctors, please, please remember, the most important in all of this is interaction with the patients. So please make sure you see your doctor, make sure you come to the meetings at the same time, your doctors, by looking at you, they can really pull a lot of data, more than you can imagine, and be able to tell. And examining you is very important. Examining liver, touching liver, all of us have now high experience in regard to really how its liver is touched and what do you feel under and what really is what we like or what we don't like or we we'll worry about. Within that context, it's very important then to understand that imaging, like CAT scan, MRI, is nothing more than a benchmark to just confirm to us what we know already clinically. So please don't live to the CAT scan, live your life. And if anything, the CAT scan and the MRI will be only to really confirm something. And then it comes to blood work. Blood work is needed because we like to make sure that your liver is safe and we're taking care of it. And also what we call alpha fetoprotein, which is a tumor marker, admittedly is not a confirmed tumor marker. Yes, we use it, we test it, we check it out, but it's not necessarily that we have to live by the number. It's not that if the number is high, it means bad, and if the number is low, it means good. Yes, it can, but not always that way, because there are many other reasons why the numbers can go high and low, and as such, we should not really interpret it only from one perspective. So as such, you can see that the story is way broader than simply a uh, CAT scan or a MRI. It's really more about the interaction with the doctor, the physical exam, the imaging, correct, add to the blood work to be able to build a co very uh, collective picture of all this information to, of course, better serve patient better. I would like to finish by wrapping up what I just spoke about endlessly. I've uh, been doing this for more than 20 years. And if anything, I remember very well when I started doing it. Sadly, we did not have any of those choices that I spoke and I kind of, you know, bombard you with all information about. And if anything, I remember, I used to tell patients go home and look where we are today. And please, please remember that this kind of, you know, effort, we have done all of it together. If anything, I can't thank more important than anybody else, the patient and their loved ones, because they entrusted us on what we really dealt with together. This is kind of like a story that started from nothing to where we are today. We moved from zero drugs to one drug, and now we are with eight drugs, add to number nine and 10, as we just heard, 
at 2 a.m. this morning that will probably hopefully add to the planetarium of what we have for our patients. So please always have faith, always in trust that, you know, if you're doing well clinically, hopefully it will translate in you doing well. And please, please always keep in touch with your doctors, let them know. And by all means, we kind of are always there to help you out as a team. And we kind of, you know, always will do our best to kind of make sure that we continue to live with that cancer. So I'll stop here and I'll pass it back to Dr. Gray. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abuel, for that was incredible. I will uh, introduce, I'll ask Dr. Teddy to also come back on the screen. There we are, beautiful flowers and all. So what we'd like to do now is open up the Q&A to ask your questions. And we've been getting some great questions through the chat. So please feel free to continue to enter those in. Um, and I'll get started with what we have so far. So the first category of questions that's come up is, how does one keep their liver healthy? How can we prevent either progressive liver disease or liver disease to begin with? Or once we've been diagnosed with cirrhosis, what can we do to keep our livers healthy? And maybe Dr. Taddy, I'll start with you on that. So there is a lot you can do to keep your liver healthy. And ideally, we'd love to see more preventive medicine. Um, I think we live in a country that tends to focus uh, more on when people have fallen ill than on how to stay healthy. So uh, the number one and two drivers of liver disease really globally now are alcohol and being overweight. And those are entirely modifiable risk factors, which means that if you don't drink to excess, it's very unlikely you're going to hurt your liver. And if you uh, keep a lean, healthy lifestyle and make healthy food choices, it's highly unlikely you're going to develop obesity, diabetes, and, and the things that lead most commonly to fatty liver disease. I can't really stress that enough uh, because a lot of the habits that we make when we're younger and invincible and generally healthy come home to roost when we're older. So it's very important to think about your health overall along a continuum where longevity has now increased significantly. Um, and yet we have abundance. We have abundance of alcohol. We have abundance of food. Um, at least in this country, you can get alcohol anywhere. You can get food anywhere, usually pretty low quality food. Um, so think carefully about your habits and about the habits, not only that you have, but that you share with your children and your families, because you set an example by how you live your life. And families that engage in physical activity, uh, that put health and wellness um, you know, at front and center of really living a holistic life, those are habits you instill uh, in the next generation. And we are in dire need of that in this country. So that's really the bottom line um, in terms of you know, what to do preventively. But hepatitis C can be cured now. So if you've never been tested, you should be tested, anybody 18 and over, and get treated if you have hepatitis C because you'll cure the virus, reduce your chances of developing cirrhosis, and vastly reduce any chances of developing cancer. Hepatitis B is a virus that's endemic in a lot of other parts of the world and certainly on the coasts in the United States. Um, you should be tested, and there's legislation going forward actually looking for a one-time hepatitis B testing in all people over 18. Uh, there are antivirals for hepatitis B. There are no cures yet, but I think there will be soon. And we can keep the virus at bay if needed. A lot of people have a sort of tolerance to hepatitis B. So um, it's important to understand your risk factors that may underlie liver disease. Um, so those are the most important things that, at keeping your liver healthy. If you have cirrhosis, actually, you can stay healthy for a period of, of time, usually oftentimes through the end of your life, by removing whatever it is that, that caused the cirrhosis if you can remove it. So for example, if you have alcohol-related cirrhosis, you stop drinking, your liver gets a second wind. Oftentimes people with compensated alcoholic cirrhosis can live for decades if they stop drinking, okay? So that type of, of sort of, do, do you have something that can be treated or removed that will prevent the progression of liver disease is really the conversation you should be having about um, keeping your liver healthy, whether you have no liver disease at all, or whether you, you know, have cirrhosis. And just remember that prevention um, is wonderful. And we as a country really need to think about these things uh, from a population health standpoint. Uh, it's very well said, completely agree. And two follow-up questions that come from that. The first is, 
Are there specific tests that patients should be speaking with their doctor about to assess the health of the liver? So liver tests are often done at periodic points in a person's life when they're getting routine clinical care. Um, so oftentimes uh, liver tests will be checked uh, by your primary care physician. Uh, for example, um, oftentimes around the time they check cholesterol, um, around the time they might be thinking about uh, prescribing a drug, for example. Um, it's really important to know though that liver disease per se is silent, okay? People usually don't have symptoms of liver disease until their liver is very sick. So you really need to think about your family history. If you have family history of liver disease, you definitely wanna bring that up with your doctor. If you're engaging in behaviors that may have exposed you to hepatitis C or B, or if you've never been tested for those and you're an adult, you should certainly talk to your doctor about that. Um, and really, if you struggle with um, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, or uh, diabetes, or a combination of the above, it is important to consider liver disease um, because oftentimes people are very worried about getting cholesterol levels down or thinking about heart disease. And we have very good medications and tests for that, but the liver disease is kind of like an afterthought, right? So those conversations have to be had. Um, and I think one of our jobs as specialists in this field is to really bring awareness to primary care doctors on just how prevalent liver disease is and when to think about it in the course of your sort of well adult visits. Um, but it is really important to, to have a visit, right? So, you know, I, I, it always amazes me that we care so much about our children's well child visits and their vaccination records. And we have all kinds of ways of keeping track of that. And the minute we're adults, we're like, yeah, whatever, right? And that's a really bad example to set for your kids. Like the minute they turn 18, hey, forget it. You got all your vaccines, don't worry about it anymore. We really need care through all of the stages of our lives, right? Because we have a lot of changes that happen as we get older. And we also you know, change our behaviors as we get older. And so it's really important to seek periodic medical care to also understand that you need vaccines through your adulthood too. So it doesn't stop. You know, it's, it's not like mom and dad say, okay, you're fine. And then you never have to worry about your health anymore. And actually what's really important is to set the example for your kids. So I think we all have a relative who probably was diagnosed with a cancer very late in life. And it was like, oh yeah, they, they hadn't gone to the doctor in 30 years. And by the time they went, they were just so far gone. They were exhausted, lost weight, et cetera. That should never be the case. You know, primary care and preventive medicine will keep you well. And so those are the things that you really need to engage in. And the conversation about liver disease should certainly be spurred on if you have a family history of liver disease, if there are abnormalities in routine liver tests that can be, as I said, checked periodically. Um, so do keep your doctors informed, but most importantly, go to the doctor. I think that really emphasizes something we're all trying to hammer home today, which is like, this is a team, not only a team amongst providers, but a team amongst patients and providers. And so really advocating for yourself, going to the doctor, asking the questions. And the simple question is, have we checked my liver? Is it healthy? Is a really great way to start. Um, so I, I think that that's something that hopefully everyone's going to take away today. Uh, another question that came up along these lines is the question of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and whether there is an increased risk of cancer, even when those patients don't have cirrhosis. And then how do we deal with the screening around that? Um, do you have a thought on that? That's a very tough area because um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is so highly prevalent. Um, and it's still, if you look at the people who do develop liver cancer without cirrhosis, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. So at this point, it doesn't justify saying, okay, we're gonna screen everybody with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease without cirrhosis for liver cancer. The real question is where do we move the field forward in terms of biomarkers? Who are those people, right? We just don't have enough data yet to be able to pick those people out. And I think the more we learn about liver cancer, the more we learn about biomarkers and um, things that we can detect in blood and on, and, you know, and tissue, the closer we'll get there. And even on imaging, we learn a lot from imaging as well. So we're not really um, able to say that people without cirrhosis in the setting of fatty liver disease should be getting screening. But I think it's also really important to remember 
that fatty liver disease is actually one of the most modifiable uh, reasons for developing cirrhosis. So if you can actually modify behaviors, which I know is a lot easier said than done, you know, you may actually prevent the progression of scarring to cirrhosis to cancer. And know also that it's, it's really important to know that not everybody with cirrhosis gets liver cancer, okay? It's a risk for developing liver cancer, but cirrhosis in and of itself is not A, a death sentence, or B, an absolute that you're gonna get liver cancer. So all of these things, we need to have more data to understand who are those people who will develop cirrhosis if they have fatty liver disease. Who are the people with cirrhosis who will develop liver cancer? So that's where the field needs to move in order for us to do good risk prediction and to have good biomarkers that can inform how we take care of populations. I think that's an important thing. And, and just to remember in terms of quoting a risk for liver cancer within cirrhosis, it, it's dependent, but for one of the, the quotes would be about 3% per year of people who have cirrhosis will go on to develop liver cancer. So that's just something to remind ourselves of. The risk is low, but it's not zero. And when we find things early, we can apply all these various therapies that Dr. Abu Alpha mentioned. And so that's why it's important to stay ahead of the game here, both by preventing the progression of cirrhosis by modifying the risk factors, like for example, alcohol or fatty liver, but also once we're there, then continue to stay on top of things. So excellent. Uh, the next thing where we wanna move to is treatment. So one question for you, Dr. Abraf, is what things can patients be doing to get ready for treatment? Are there things, we've kind of talked a lot about behavioral modification, but is there anything specific patients can be doing on their way to getting treatment? Uh, thanks so much for whoever asked this question. This is a very critical one. And uh, if anything, uh, again, as I mentioned when I was uh, kind of debriefing on all the treatments, uh, please, please remember, this is not the knee jerk kind of you know, reaction. It's not like I have this, I do that. Uh, pause, uh, make sure that you take your time to really understand better. And if anything, you will notice that uh, understandably, uh, a patient will come, I have liver cancer, I wanna fix it right now. And remember, please, in the complexity that you are already appreciating from your experience and what you're hearing from us of the disease, you don't want ever to go on the next step until you know that the step that you are on is very firm and solid. For example, did I do the right imaging? Did I complete all the appropriate blood work? Did I do all the testing needed for risk factors as we heard from Dr. Day? In regard to other things, did I need a biopsy? Was it done correctly? Did I get the right tissue? Was it done for genetic testing, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of steps that might not necessarily imply that I have this, I'm gonna do that tomorrow. It might take a little bit of time until do that. Now, along that line, it's very important to remember that the time frame that we live within is not the one that the same time frame that the cancer live within. In other words, for us, a minute is a minute. But for the cancer, a minute is way longer than we think, because sadly, the reality is, for example, for a hepatitis C patient, the cancer evolve over 10 to 30 years. It doesn't happen just overnight. So as such, anything that your doctor will tell you to do and you say, well, but wait a minute, it's going to grow in that week while I'm waiting. Absolutely not. It's really uh, preferable, of course, if we can do everything right away, because of course we'll all feel better. But the uh, reasonableness of what the physicians might ask you to do, and it might take that week or so, it's not the end of the world. It's okay to just be patient that regard. So the other component I'd like to ask uh, to talk about in regard to this first preparation, come engaged to the physician. Uh, there are kind of two perspectives that can be brought into this. I number one, come and I don't know, and I care less, and I'm upset. That's fair, you might be upset. But please, in that setting, always don't ever come on yourself. Four eyes, four ears is better than two and two. And if anything, please always bring your family member, your loved ones, your friend. Um, I always jokingly, I tell my patients, uh, oh, who, who is this? Oh, this is so-and-so. Oh, uh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a nurse. And I told them always, I'm so happy you're here because I never saw a patient to bring, for example, their real estate agent. 
they always bring somebody who is in healthcare. So always you have connection, you have friends. Please don't feel like, oh my God, the doctors might not be happy if I bring my doctor, my friend who's a doctor or my friend who's a nurse. Absolutely not. Actually, they are our colleagues. We like them too, because they now smartly you bring the right person because they can read both languages. They are your friend, they are a colleague, they are your family member, and also they understand the medical language. So they can be very important to really connect. But please don't ever go to your doctor on your own. On the other hand, please, it's very important, don't come with the quizzing mood. In other words, I'm going to come and I'm going to quiz everything and I'm going to question that. Don't worry. It's not like we don't know and it's not that we're scared of it. But please, rather engage in a teamwork perspective. In other words, rather than saying, uh, how much do you do this? Or when do you do that? And for example, jokingly, somebody by 10 a.m. asked me, for example, how many times you have seen this? I'll tell them, you mean today? And because, you know, we're all kind of like really immersed our life into this. So please come as a team member. Don't come as being like, okay, we're going to quiz that doctor. In general, people will tell you humbly and very appropriately, if I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. And if anything, I'll connect you with the expert that we will really will help better in that regard, or I'll get them on the phone or what have we. So come with your questions, but really more for your perspective. Don't come to quiz the doctor, come to quiz the disease. It's very important to build that kind of, you know, collegial relationship and this kind of teamwork bonding right from the start. And you won't believe it how much you'll go far long with a doctor in regard to do everything. Because I can assure you, we're all humans as well. We really care. You should see how many times I will probably pause in the middle of the uh, clinic and some patients probably, if they are listening, they will know that about me. I might say, forgive me, I'll be back in a second. And the first thing I might just go for a second and I'm not kidding, I'll be standing the hallway and I'm taking a deep breath because the important next part of the discussion is gonna be very critical and I'm prepping myself mentally to make sure I work as a team. So please be assured, we'll do everything we can even out of our way to make sure that we are here to help you and serve you everything we can. Wonderful, thank you. So other questions about therapy include, um, can surgery be used for liver cancer treatment? Maybe speaking a bit about resection as an option. And I'm sorry, I didn't uh, get the, the first part of the question. Can what uh, be Can resection, uh -huh. surgical resection of for the sure. cancer be used? When is that applied? Yeah, yeah, so, so thanks so much again uh, for the question. And as we refer to, in general, if the cancer is limited to the liver itself, and at the same time, not involving the blood vessels that really feed into the liver. In general, it can be taken out. Uh, there could be a little bit of discussion about if it's taken out or not based on the liver function. Because as we spoke, if the liver function is not that good, you don't want to have it taken out because it might actually, whatever you take out of the liver, it will kind of, you lose on liver function. And this is where transplant comes into play. And so, in other words, we have resection, we have radiofrequency ablation for smaller lesions, but at the same time we have transplant in case the liver function is not good. So again, if you're not sure, it's a good idea to ask your doctor and they will refer you if appropriately so. And this is where the team approach is so important. As a liver doctor myself, I'm always assessing how strong is a patient's under underlying liver to determine if they could tolerate having a piece of it removed. And if not, then we're talking about, for example, transplant or other potential therapies. And just a, a, a clarification from something that came into the, the chat, one of the questions was, can ablative therapy in a severely scarred liver be used preventatively? And no, that is not something that we, um, we do preventatively. Um, so we'll move along there to the next question is um, maybe a, a bit of a review again about available treatments for metastatic liver cancer. So let's define again for the group, what is metastatic liver cancer and then how do we approach it from the, the first line and then potentially the second line, just in some bullet points. Sure, by all means, actually, it's a little bit not uh, kind of like a clear cut between what's metastatic, what's not, because we have to remember that even locally advanced disease in the liver, at some point, there could be a limit to much how much the local therapy can do. In other words, don't be surprised. Sometimes your doctor might say, you know what, we're going to apply systemic therapy, or I'm going to refer you to the oncologist to do systemic therapy, because I don't think, for example, the local therapy is helpful anymore. So it's really transitional component in the pass on from the local to the systemic therapy. With this said, systemic therapy will imply that the cancer, either it's beyond the control area of where it is in the liver, including, for example, extensive lymph nodes. 
And we already are, have known, and we published that, the four organs that mostly where cancer of the liver can go, include the lung, include the lymph nodes, include the adrenal glands, and also include the bone. And so your doctor will look everywhere, will definitely depend a lot on you expelling, exp expressing any symptoms per se. I will do whatever necessary to conform that the disease is there or not. And accordingly, would we'll apply the systemic therapy. Uh, and I don't know, maybe I'll stop here because probably we'll get another question on the, the systemic therapy details or would like to go on. I think maybe uh, the specific question also is what are the available treatments for metastatic uh, liver cancer? So maybe just continuing to talk about those therapies a bit again. No, that's a great continuation of what we just spoke about. And uh, if anything, as we said, systemic therapy is very extensive at the moment. In first line, so far, we have three options, including, as we said, sorafenib, lymvatinib, and atezolizumab plus bevacizumab. And as we just said, as of 10 hours ago, there is at least positive data on a new combination called darvalumab plus tramilumab, but we are waiting for seeing the data and see how it's going to come, hopefully, become another standard of care. Add to this, in second-line therapy, we have cabozantinib, Rigorafenib, Ramisurumab, and we have also atizolizumab and all, sorry, pembrolizumab and also uh, ipilumab plus nivolumab. And then in third line, we have cabozantinib. Uh, I know it's a little bit too much of uh, kind of uh, uh, fancy words, make us look smart, but <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, be assured if you want to remember them in a practical way, targeted therapy or what we say, kind of pills, because they are mostly pills, uh, except for one of them. And number two is immunotherapy. And we have noticed that immunotherapy plus targeted therapy fare better than targeted therapy by itself. And now the new thing that I do just heard 10 hours ago at 2 a.m. in the morning Eastern time is immunotherapy plus immunotherapy can make a big difference. So that's really what we're waiting for more details on. And I, I want to clarify what immunotherapy is, and I'm going to quote a, a colleague and good friend, Dr. Katie Kelly from UCSF, and she talks about how cancer cells are like Harry Potter's invisibility cloak, and that's one of the reasons why cancer cells can grow is because the immune system itself typically does not see the cancer cells, and what immunotherapy does is it takes off the invisibility cloak such that now the immune system can see the abnormal cancer cells and then attack those cancer cells. So that's one of the things that has really revolutionized cancer therapy in general and has really helped make such a difference in liver cancer in specific. Um, excellent. So the, the next question I have is um, from the group is, can we talk a little bit about cell therapy? Is cell therapy something that we're looking into with liver cancer? Yeah, thanks so much. Actually, I saw that uh, question in the chat and I'm so happy I was waiting for it. <laughs> so, so if anything, a great uh, question. Uh, cell therapy implies, by definition, what we are trying to do is make the immune cells in our body not only see the cancer, but even smell it. And then others can go after it and even get rid of it altogether. That kind of approach, what we call CAR-T therapy, has already been approved for two types of lymphoma. At the moment, there's a lot of interest in regard to cell therapy coming to the treatment of different solid tumors, among which, of course, liver cancer. So there has been some clinical trials. Some of them have been happening here and there in the US. And if anything, uh, the challenge become, uh, remains two. Number one, are we checking the appropriate antigen? In other words, are we going after the specific target where we can attack those cells? And number two, how safe is it? Because we are really launching the immune system in a different way. Uh, so these kind of efforts are still happening worldwide. And we proudly, many of us, I know UCSF where that guy is and ourselves at Sloan Catering are really keep lead on it. And if anything, at the moment, we are really have a lot of efforts happening literally worldwide uh, that we are leading from here from Sloan Catering that trying to identify that antigen and with the aim to hopefully have some CAR T cell therapy for our patients soon. So yes, this is a novel thing. Whoever asked the question, you are absolutely right. This is really where we're going to go to the next level in regard to even get better outcome for patients that hopefully will even translate into cure. 20 years ago, for me to say cure in mistake disease was probably, was not right. 
But today, can I say it? It can be one day we might see that. I would say definitely we have more information on our hand that yes, we can optimistically think that way. And of course, we look forward to see that happening in our lifetime. Beautiful, beautiful. So we have just a few more minutes and a question just came into the chat that says, um, with, liver, with liver cancer patients with hepatitis C since childhood, should they undergo viral therapy? So I think there's two questions here. One is hepatitis C independent of liver cancer? Should it be treated? And then how do we approach hepatitis C treatment in those with liver cancer? So you wanna, I, th I thought maybe uh, Tamar, you wanna talk about the H hepatitis C treatment without cancer and then I'll touch on the cancer part. This is what I thought. Yeah, that, that would be great. Great. Um, so I do think it's very important that people understand unequivocally we have a cure for hepatitis C, okay? So you should get your hepatitis C cured if you have it. If you haven't been tested, you should get tested for it. Um, children are tested if their parents have hepatitis C um, quite often. Um, and that's another sort of historical thing. You know, if your mother had hepatitis C, you should tell your provider that if you hadn't been tested, for example. Um, and then, you know, now that we have really a bona fide cure in like 98% of patients, and these are all pills, there are no injectables, it's taken for anywhere from six to 12 weeks um, with the durable cure, meaning you don't have that virus in your body anymore, there is absolutely no reason not to get treated. So I'll stop there and then we can talk about the nuance of treating with cancer. Yeah, no, by all means. And uh, absolutely, this is, uh, please remember for everybody, we're proud and we're delighted to know that the Nobel Prize for medicine last year was for this. And I'll tell you, it's so humbling that actually, you know, one of the Nobel laureates is actually our neighbor here at Rockefeller University, and we work together quite a bit. And it's really very touching to kind of like see this set close to home happening. So by all means, this was great news. At the same time, of course, the next question is, patients who have liver cancer already, will we treat or not? Sadly, in that reality, the cat is out of the bag already. And in other words, the damage in the liver already is there. So really, we don't have full evidence that treating the cancer, uh, correction, treating the virus is going to make any difference in regard to the cancer. But nonetheless, I would say that this is a work of effort that's still ongoing. And if anything, again, to go back to the teamwork perspective, I would say this is where the oncologist and the hepatologists need to talk to each other and try to kind of guide the patient accordingly in regard to the applicability. Because remember what I mentioned beforehand, can we have scenarios where, for example, we have a complete response to therapy? Of course it can happen. And if this is the case, can we then, for example, tackle the uh, virus itself? Of course we can think of, but we have to really think a little bit carefully in regard to the assessment and not to think about those two things are as independent. Well, I'll deal with this with the cancer doctor and I'll deal with that with the hepatitis doctor. Absolutely not. They are really a teamwork that should be involved in that regard because the data is not fully fledged in regard to treatment of a patient with liver cancer, with hepatitis C treatment at this point in time. Uh, we really don't have a full understanding of that. So it's not yet the recommendation per se. And I think there's an important uh, clarifier here, which is the data is ongoing to understand about hepatitis C, but it's very clear in hepatitis B that patients who have cirrhosis should be treated for hepatitis B and patients who have liver cancer, they should be treated with hepatitis B. So different viruses, different approaches, but in case there are different members in the audience, I want to make sure that that's stated.